You're listening to the Afterburn Podcast, episode number 40. Yeah, okay, I got one. I'll tell you about election night in Afghanistan. So there I was in 2009 on a deployment in Bagram, uh, flying the F-15E, and election night, which is a significant event in the country, was, was coming up. And so the posture for that, the, uh, the army had reduced their patrols and, and wanted to eliminate the military presence around the election centers. I get put on a 12 hour night alert shift on election night because I'm flying too much. As, as expected, there's troops and contacts popping up everywhere. So we, we get launched, we go through, uh, I think two, two or three troops and contacts is like the first one and Bravo is the second. So we're on like Alpha Alpha, which is like 20, you know, 22, <laughs> Alpha Bravo, Alpha yeah. Charlie. Oh my God, it's going crazy. So we are we reset. And at this point, like the AOR is going crazy. So there's probably 70, 80 ticks that have opened all Jeez. in the span of like this like yeah. 12 hour window. My guest today is Mike Benitez, call sign Paco, and that's a snippet from his There I Was story, which is exclusive for Patreon supporters. If you have any interest in supporting the podcast, you can swing over to patreon.com backslash the Afterburn podcast, and you can check out some additional content, get early access to episodes, and support the podcast. And as always, if you're not interested in doing that, I always ask if you're enjoying the content, just consider swinging over to iTunes and spend the 10 to 15 seconds and leave a rating or review that helps the podcast out. And I appreciate it. All right. With the admin knocked out, let's talk about my guest today, Mike Paco Benitez. He is a Wizzo by trade. That's a weapon system officer. However, he started his military career in the Marines as a door gunner in the CH 46 and CH 53. Some combat deployments from the Marines and then multiple combat deployments in the F-15E. And he even has an F-18 combat sortie in there just to mix things up. He has done fellowships at DARPA and Congress in Silicon Valley. I first saw him kind of pop up on social media with the fighter pilot crisis the Air Force was really going after back in the 2014 to 2016 timeframe. We talk about that today. I think Paco brings some good insight to what's happening inside the Air Force and the DOD which he really has a passion about. And in fact, he has started a newsletter, which is called The Merge. You can go to themerge.co and sign up for it or view the archive there. But it's objective material that's given insight into national security interest. I had a buddy, Fitty, who is actually the second guest on this podcast, introduced me to The Merge newsletter. If you're kind of tired of the fluff pieces that you see scrolling through on whatever news app you're using, I think Paco does a really good job of digging into actually the meat of whatever the issue is that he's happening to be tackling that week. So if you're interested in defense and national security related content, the merge.co is another source that you can gather some information from that I think you'll like if you're interested in this type of material. All right, that's enough about that. With that being said, let's get into the episode with Paco. Not this morning, I guess. Mm-mm. So, just a little Viper reset, you know. Turn it off, turn it back on. Turn it off, turn it on, run a bit. <laughs> turn it off, turn it back on. <laughs> so, but yeah, I was saying, like, the Merge, what made you start the Merge newsletter? Uh, well, I. that's a great question. So, if you go back a couple of years, uh, I, you know, I go through and I read a lot of uh, happenings of what's going on in industry, what's going on in the military, and... It, it got really, really hard uh, to sort through all the chaff. And so by that, I mean, like the things that, while interesting, you really can't do anything with that information in a way to either make yourself smarter 
or uh, to monetize it, quite honestly, from the industrial point of view. So things like, oh, a uniform change, like who cares? Uh, you know, hey, this commander got fired for doing something stupid. Who cares? Like, so, you know, deployments, rotations. So what I wanted to cover was that intersection of kind of defense technology trends and forecasting. And so you can see from the warfighter's perspective where industry is leaning and where the future is kind of like leaning towards. And from the industry's perspective, the warfighter applications and some of the promising technology. So it's kind of right at the intersection between the two. And my uh, the readership uh, base is, is pretty eclectic. It kind of spans from uh, think tanks to uh, industry. And that's uh, you know, th your normal defense primes to a lot of tech startups to a lot of uh, a lot of people in the Air Force, uh, honestly. Uh, some senior yeah. uh, so senior officials uh, that I, I won't list uh, who, who they are, but there's a lot of senior officials that read it. And then there's a, a lot of people on Capitol Hill that read it as well. So it's, uh, you know, there's there's obviously some responsibility in, in content there to not. Uh, right. and, and I'm never disparaging about anything, but just calling it like it is. Yeah. So we're talking about the Merge newsletter and that's the Merge.co, right? Yep. I uh, highly recommend people swing over there and check it out. Um, I had a buddy, F-35 guy, who's down there at Eglin who introduced me to it. So I think by word of mouth, it's kind of growing. One of the things which I think a lot of people can kind of align with, especially nowadays with the news, there's so much noise out there. And usually it's clickbaitish, or it's there to enact some kind of emotion when you really just want facts. So when I signed up for the newsletter, one, I didn't know at first that the archive exists on the website. So you can go back and read previous newsletters, but it's factual. And obviously it's defense focused, but you can actually get concrete data points that are put together very well. And you can walk away having learned something, which I really like and appreciate. And I know it takes a lot of time to do that. What's your normal flow? Like, how do you, I mean, how do you come up with this stuff? Are you just sitting there and you see something in Air Force Times, it's a fluff piece and actually go dig into the facts or is it just something you're interested in? Yeah, so uh, great question. What what I actually did was I took kind of my normal habit patterns and kind of operationalized it. So I probably read an hour to an hour and a half a day of just different news sources and the things. So instead of just reading it and going, that's interesting and kind of filing it away in my nugget, uh, I decided to just start capturing some of those things, those headlines. And, and I release it every week and I do that on purpose because I do not want to get caught up in the news hype cycle, which is really easy yeah. to do when you go to something that's uh, more frequent. And so if I collect something on Monday that I think is pretty interesting, you know, by Friday, it might be uh, you know, nonsense. And so I'm just not going to cover it. So I do that and then I, I've, I built myself some processes to basically uh, do it as a one man show. I do have a, yeah, I do yeah. have a good friend of mine who who sanity checks my final draft to make sure yeah. uh, my grammar uh, is correct and things like that. Uh, and he and he's a he's a part time contributor, so he he helps out a little bit. And it's uh, I could I couldn't do it all by myself, so I do uh, I do lend on my friend quite a bit. Yeah, so obviously you're reading a lot every single day. How long does it take you to make a newsletter? No, oh, longer than you think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like I said, if I spend an hour a day reading and consuming info and then there's uh actually categorizing it and then building it into the format that you read whether it's the trivia or uh the, the zoom in section like here read more and this is why it's important or uh the kind of the long the long format piece so about 500 or less words on something that's kind of a deeper dive just from my perspective so th that's probably the the only really opinionated section is up front but it's it's very objective based uh, so I try not to lean left or right on anything. That, yeah, and that's what I mean. I really appreciate. So I first saw you pop up. Your, I mean, your career. We're gonna go through a bunch of stuff, but F fifteen, F eighteen, a Marine, door gunner. So you've done a bunch of stuff. Where I first saw your name kind of start popping up was a few years ago, 2015, 2014 time frame, in twenty sixteen. So the Air Force is going through a fighter pilot retention problem. They created a Facebook group really to like kind of crush WAMs. And word of mouth. So get stuff, real information out there, doing all these different initiatives to try and make quality life better, to try and keep and retain people. And I saw you posting and responding a lot on there with a lot of like good concrete data and facts, what's going on. At that time, you were up at the Pentagon or up on Capitol Hill working some of these initiatives. Can you kind of talk a little bit about fighter pilot retention? Is that still a problem? 
what's you know what's going on i know you can speak intelligently about it and i'm curious yeah so back to the beginning uh i didn't even have a facebook account actually when that when that was going on <laughs> and a uh you know a buddy a couple of buddies of mine had three or four buddies that, that were you know kind of in a group text this is you know whatever it's five years ago now probably something like that and uh they're like you know they would screenshot things going on and i was like oh that's not real like oh this is what's really happening and like how do you know all this because like, you, know, you either I'm directly involved or I'm one person removed. It's like the, you know, the, the six separations of Kevin Bacon in DC. Yeah. Like <laughs> if you want to get involved and get a pulse on what's going on, it's pretty easy to figure it out. And so at the time I was, uh, I was flight following that pretty closely. And so I could tell you the, the ins and outs of what's actually going on, reading between the lines, what they're not saying, why they're not saying it. And, uh, you know, there's some transparency that's there and there's some messaging that, that needs to take place. And so it's all, you know, it gets scoped by the time it comes out of the sausage factory it's uh it's easy to misinterpret what's going on so they were like hey joint joint please just join this group so that's how i got on onto that facebook group i like i said i had to create an account uh to get on <laughs> facebook <laughs> so not a uh not really big into social media uh back then obviously and then uh while i was in the pentagon so i, I worked uh, worked a few different jobs uh i worked for um, the chairman of the joint chiefs for legislative affairs for about six months then i okay. went across the the street over to uh, Congress. So I worked for a senator for a year in his office. Uh, we're in a, a ditch the flight suit for a three piece suit. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> came back to the Pentagon to work for the secretary of the Air Force as the uh, chief of fighter programs for legislative affairs. So fighters, munitions, that kind of stuff back to the hill. And in that intersection uh, at the time, we have a we have a personnelist that was also kind of a key representative for the secretary to the hill. And there was a there was an obvious disconnect of the the rated officer uh, problems and the messaging because the way that it was kind of diluted and distilled down through the the personnel point of view and not the the person. And so I tried. I joined a couple of internal working groups for the uh, Air Force uh, Air Crew Crisis Task Force at the time, and okay. I became kind of the uh, the outside individual that was kind of throwing spears and, and, th and helping everyone think more critically about. You know, here's here are some options that we can do. Um, here's how we can message it, and you know, we we had a few wins, but I'll tell you, the uh, the bureaucracy kind of uh, crushed most of the efforts. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that if you want. Um, again, I'm truth truth and lending, so <laughs> I'm not hiding anything. Yeah, that's what I mean. I feel like there are a lot of really good and motivated people out there that have really good intentions. And I saw it with a couple of commanders who I thought were phenomenal leaders, but it's like they can only really pick their one battle to like pour their energy into because they're getting attacked from all sides and there's only so much you can do. But the, I mean, it does come down to like, there's so much red tape and bureaucracy, it seems like that to get something that should be very simple to do, you know, you have to send a memo through 15 different people, right? Which it should be VFR direct to you to make the decision, but got to follow this process and it just seems like things are stagnant and just don't happen and it drags out for months but typically years depending on how complicated or what the ask is and what money is involved so i mean why i mean why is it that way why can't the red tape be broken down i know the standard answer probably is it depends but um yeah what what is it yeah so i think uh human nature if you go back over history uh for the first step of solving a problem throughout the, at least the United States history is to establish an organization. And so <laughs> when you, when you do that, I mean, you think of every, every branch of government that exists, it exists out of a crisis, whether it's the CIA, the De department of defense, the NGA, uh, the NSA, department of Homeland security, nine 11. So never in a crisis have we go, you know what, let's, let's close these organizations and streamline some things and, and cut some bureaucracy. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. They just find, they establish another organization and find a way to try to connect it uh, to everything else that already exists. And so over time, you have layers upon layers upon layers of band-aids. Uh, and it's really hard to cut through all those layers of uh, crap to, to get some things done. And I will tell you, you know, we had, there was a time where we, the chief, uh, he had asked us, you know, hey, give me, give me, your, uh, give me your score sheet. I, I want to see what's going on here. And so we had had internally had probably uh, over 50, probably close to 60 different initiatives that we had like come up with. We red teamed it like these are all great ideas. 
And of those 50 to 60, we had three, three that had been implemented. And you know, that's Is this the word document that you guys were sending out that had like a stoplight chart of like where the progress was and where it's sitting. Is that what I'm thinking? of? Uh, yeah, that was part of it. And uh, honestly, you know, it goes back to critical thinking, you know, as, uh, as amazing that, that fighter pilots think they are, uh, <laughs> there, there is a, there is a, a level of critical thinking that very, very, very few people can, uh, can elevate themselves to, to fully understand the problem. And so because of that, a lot of the initiatives weren't really addressing the root causes of problems. They were just more band-aids and, you know, at the, at the person that's dealing with the pain. So out in the cockpits on the flight line and in the squadrons, you know, they can see right through that. And that's that disconnect where you start losing the narrative. You, you start losing your own team is because if you're, if you're out of touch with what's, what's really going on, then you're not going to be able to understand the real problem. And therefore, whatever solutions you do propose, while they might look great in a headline and they might look well in a, you know, a congressional hearing, uh, they're not ever going to work. So we had, uh, we had a few initiatives. And here's the other part of it is that it, it's very easy to blame Congress, but of the of most of the initiatives that we had come up with, uh, we already had all of the authorities in law to do it. So one of the things that we com- we came up with again, like kind of getting out there and critically thinking is, you know, the Air Force, and, and you know this from pilot training, you graduate pilot training and you get a ten year service commitment. It, the law doesn't say that. That is an Air Force policy. Yeah. the The law says eight years, and so the Navy, if you're in the Navy, you have an eight year contract. And depending on what platforms you fly, they're a little bit less. But the Air Force is a blanket ten-year contr- uh, policy. Like we could change that. We and so when you listen to you know the dudes in the uh, in the fighter squadrons, and they're like, "Well, I, I just want I want more control of my life." And you go, "Well, we can give you control of your life back. We can cut this to two years. We have the authorities to do this." And the interesting disconnect becomes when you start what ifing it. You go, "What if everyone gets out?" Well. Well, that's still the, the Air Force's fault. <laughs> it doesn't change right. the situation, right? It's like, right. that's, again, we're, there's, you know, big, uh, big problems require big solutions. And uh, it's, and they're, you know, multi-step, multi-phased uh, uh, approach. And it was very linear of how, like, you know, this problem has this solution. This problem has this solution. Well, you know, one problem usually has four or five solutions that all have to be integrated and applied uh, in order to work. And, and a lot of that got lost in just the, the staffing of stuff between, you know, if I've got initiative A, it has to go through these five different sequences to get to the right person. And initiative B has to go through these other five instances and organizations. And then it gets, the message gets lost along the way of like, what is the, what is the actual strategy to fix this problem? And, you know, one of the big heartburns that a lot of us had internally is the, the chief of staff had declared it a crisis. Okay, okay great. What are the conditions to resolve the crisis? Is there a certain manning level, a certain retention level? What are the goals and metrics? Like nothing. And so eventually they just stopped calling it a crisis. But it doesn't mean That's it what, went away. Yeah, I, I feel like it just kind of fizzled. And granted, I was entering a transition out of active duty in the reserves and I'm not flying, I'm doing recruiting. So like I'm now further removed from the problem. I still kind of like follow it to a certain degree and then through the bro network. But I really don't feel like anything has really changed. Now, there are, I mean, some of those initiatives did happen, right? But COVID is a variable that got injected that probably affected retention to a certain degree. But I feel like we're on the back side of that. And those same problems are going to start to manifest or they're going to start showing again. I mean, do you think there was success out of that? Do you think it was a Band-Aid? Where are we? Well, I'd say success is measured in the long term, not the short term. And so it has to transcend the tenure of anyone uh, who's instituting change, right? So you can't measure that. Now, that being said, it's been a few years. So some of the things that were implemented, such as bringing in help to actually uh, restaff the squadrons and some of the administrative stuff so we can stop working 12 to 14 hour days. Um, And then bringing in uh, people to do uh, like neck and back, um, you know, chiropractor, massage, and I don't think people understand like uh, the the toll that that takes on your body. Uh, right. So that was uh, optimizing the human performance of the weapon system, I believe was the acronym. Uh, so we brought that in, and that was you know morale goes through the roof. We actually have people who care about uh, treating our uh, pilots as a weapon system, which is the which is what uh, SOCOM uses. So for their operators, if they treat their people like a weapon system, there is 
there are different phases. There's phase maintenance. And so uh, for a long time, we were, you know, we weren't really treated as people. Uh, and so this was a great way forward, uh, very small cost, huge return on investment. Um, so that was great. And I tell you that to say the Air Force just killed that program. So. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll probably, it, it, it's, it's on the chopping block due to budget cuts. And so people look at things like that and they go, oh, these guys are pampered. We're going to cut that program. I'm like, well, get ready for the second order effects. So not only are you going to uh, lose people, you're going to break faith with an entire culture and cadre of warfighters that, you know, really could vote for with their feet. And they, they are, and they have. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that because the two things that I have seen that have garnered a lot of positive reaction one and i did see it before i got out was the civilian like schedulers udms that rolled into the squadron to alleviate some of those admin tasks and that was huge especially scheduling i mean that that in itself is just a massive time suck the next piece was everyone was talking about the human performance and having you know physical therapists massage therapists in the squadrons helping them feel better be better and perform better. So knowing those are gone, the second and third order effects of that, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. The The piece I saw, which I was surprised was the number of first assignment guys who would come up and talk to me, especially when they knew I was getting out and they would express their desire to get out. And this is, you know, obviously it's one example, right? Um, it doesn't mean it's spread across the air force, but it's interesting because Granted, I was a FAPE, so I wanted to go, and you know, I wanted to get to that first assignment and then go to the F-16, but I still didn't even think about separating and getting out. I was planning on staying in 20 years, and it wasn't until my like last two, two and a half years of my commitment that I really thought about transitioning out. And that was the same, I can say, for my most of my peers. I think we were all kind of very similar-minded like that. There might have been one or two who, hey, they knew they were going to do their 10-year commitment and separate, but everyone else was kind of willing to hang around and you know going to take the bonus but the fact that that's starting to change and guys who are in their first assignment are already thinking about their exit has me a little worried granted it's not my problem to solve really but it is it's an interesting um dynamic and then with the transition getting rid of the pension i wonder about the second and third order effects of that like if that carrot is a carrot actually hanging out in front of people getting them to stay for another eight years or so. Yeah, that's a. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so man, a couple of things to pull apart there. So, uh, so the bonus, um, that is, uh, you know, that's something that was, you know, created in the in the '90s, based on uh, airlines hiring and forced drawdowns. But when you go back and you look at the, it's just basic math. So, if you say there's a hundred percent of the people have a choice to make, and and you look at the Air Force model um, of what we depend on we depend on the, the, the way our entire system is set up is that two thirds of the people stay. And so it's 65% is always our retention goal for rated, uh, rated. It's plus or minus a little bit, but it's about 65%. Now, when you go back and you, oh, and these are guys with 10 year commitments, by the way, that are making a 65% after their 10 year commitment stay the rest of the time at their, um, so we retain them or where the air force retains them historically. Uh, the number of officers that actually serve a 20 year career is like 40% or less. So you're looking at two standard deviations above yeah. normal retention. And that's the minimum to sustain the force. And so it, it doesn't take a you know a mathematician to figure out like that's, that's dumb. Uh, there's gotta be a better way. And so, <laughs> it, you know, why, why do people get out? And you know, there's, uh, there's a hundred different reasons, right? Um, but yeah. if you take that, that model and you break it into thirds, there's a third of the people that are never going to leave, no matter how bad it gets, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> there's a third right. of the people that are never going to stay, no matter how good it gets. And so when it comes down to, like, the fight for retention is over the middle third. It's the guys that are like, I'm not really sure, like this or that. And, you know, they're weighing their options. And that is where the that is where you have to win the battle. So if you take that and uh, you apply it to uh, what was the other? I've already lost track of what we were talking about before that. There was two parts to this. If I should write it down. The, well, yeah, no, I, I hit you with a bunch there because talking through it, the like, I guess, where are we at? And I will ask, add this additional piece of info is when they did the 
the road show going around talking. There's a group of maybe 20 of us, you know, three fighter squadron at Shaw. They did multiple meetings throughout the day. They said, every one of you who are in the 06, 07, 08 year group, you'll be in 06, like if you can fog a mirror. Yep. Right? Because we don't have enough of you. So like, are we winning this battle? Are we not winning this battle? What is it going to look like? Yeah, I'd say number one, that is that I remember when that was going on. What a, ter- what a terrible value proposition, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, that's, that should not be the talking point. Uh, this is not selling me. Yeah. Again, it goes back to like understanding the problem. And so if, if one of the problems is they treated, you know, just inside the rated officers uh, pool, you have different types of rated officers. So you have got a fighter pilot, mobility pilot. Everyone kind of globbed on to the fighter pilot problem because th- there was a lot of them uh, and a lot of them were getting out. And so if we could focus energy on that one thing, it'd be great. The problem is they stopped there. And so if you break down the fighter pilot community within the Air Force, and you look, there are certain dynamics in each fleet that they have, and those weren't individually addressed. So if you're, uh, you know, the worst retention, and it's been a few years since I've looked at it, but the worst retention across the board for fighter pilots was uh, the F-15C community. It was like 15% retention. And you go, oh my God. So, so when you break out the numbers, uh, and you go, well, that's terrible. I'm like, well, why is it terrible? I'm like, well, because the way that the Air Force um, did the TFI integration of the fleet and the drawdown of the C model, there's only two active duty assignments that you can go to. One is in Japan and one is in the UK. And so if you want to be stateside and have a family and everything, like your only choice is to go to the guard reserves or go do something else or transition to another aircraft. And so the, the retention in that community is, is horrendous. And so that is one example, but every, you know, F-35 is going to have the same problem on the active duty side. When you look at the basing and where they're going to be at, um, it, it's it's the enterprise look at the problem when you make basing decisions and things like that. Um, sometimes they're not uh, factored in. So a uh, caveman's view, from my perspective, as we look at this, again, there's, there's a lot of variables that go into it. It seems like the now the push for the fix is to produce a lot of pilots yep so in order to produce a lot of pilots there are a lot of changes that are going on and a lot of different iterations of pilot training that are happening trying to pump people through the pipeline or at least that is the perception from a guy like on my end is you see kind of the surface level view of what they're doing what do you know about kind of like this pilot training next or what the efforts and initiatives are to get more bodies through the pipeline to fill cockpits? Uh, great question. So it's, uh, I'll, I'll take both sides of the question. So change needs to happen. That's the first thing. I, I don't think anyone, very few people would agree that, hey, what we're doing, that it was the model that we've been using from up until about, uh, call it 2015 or so, was the same model that was invented in 1940. The exact same model. You go, well, a lot of things have changed in the world. Is there a better way to do this? And the answer is yes. What is the better way is where the debate comes in. And so, you know, one of the talking points used to be when the, when the, the talking point was retention is, you know, how do I, you know, how do I build a, a 10 year experienced fighter pilot? Like it takes 10 years. <laughs> and right. so if, if you can accelerate the experience, uh, that's where a lot of these initiatives came in. So I have a more immersive environment. I can pair, several students to one instructor so I can, you know, experience in mass instead of one-on-one instruction and can I automate some things. Um, and so that's where a lot of these things to accelerate that experiential learning come in. Now, there have been, there have been some wins, uh, there have been some losses and some, some missteps, but, you know, I don't think if you, if you never try, like you're never gonna, you're never gonna get anything out of it, right? So, yep. you know, you don't, you know, in baseball, you don't steal bases by keeping your foot on first base, right? <laughs> You, you, you assess the situation, you get as much elite as you can. Sometimes you get, you know, you have to dive back to first. And then other times you have the right situation to make the right jump. And, and even then, you're not always going to get make it to second base. But if you got to yeah. steal bases, you got to take your foot off the bag. <laughs> Very true. Well, and that's, I had a buddy who is an instructor out at Luke. And when UPT Next first started, it was in the test phase up in Austin. He went out and visited, saw their sims. He was teaching in the seed course. 
and thought, you know, at first very, where everyone's very skeptical of this, right. Yep. And especially the messaging, the way that was going out and you play the telephone game, you're not hitting the, I believe button. He went out, saw it and ended up pursuing to get those simulators for the C course out of sim because he saw just the, the immersive experience you could put students through and what they could gain out of it. And I would agree with you. That's kind of the pieces I, I have not been and seen UPT next or UPT next 2.5. So I still like skeptical, but I firmly believe like we have technology we can leverage. And I, as a FAPE, you know, if, if you were a student coming through and you needed extra work on instrument landings and the simulator is open, we couldn't go over there and do an extra simulator. You know, so the simulator sat empty because it would be a syllabus deviation, which went all the way up to the two star, you know, and obviously it's going through all the layers of why this happened. You're like, that's silly. Like we have this technology, we have this capability. Why wouldn't we spend the time to try and make you a little bit better? Because maybe this is the thing you struggle on, but formation, you're killing it. Um, so those type things need to be changed and obviously leveraging the technology that is now available to us to make life less painful and, you know, enhance the learning experience. That's a good point. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'd say, you know? uh, let me think about this for a second. I think, uh, so first of all, truth and learning, I have not been to UPT 2.5. I've not been, uh, but I know enough about it to see what's going on. One of the things about five years ago when they were trying to, you know, it's just like your friend is like, I don't, I don't know about this thing. And then you see it, you go, oh, it's not, it's not that it's the bright, shiny object that's going to solve world hunger, but you can see right. the potential. And one of the best things that we ever did was we took one of the, the early um, prototypes for UPT Next, the, the console, and we shipped it to the Pentagon. And I think most people really, uh, know this story. So we shipped it to the Pentagon, and uh, it was there was an AETC liaison who works in the Pentagon, and they have an office in the basement. Yeah. And so they stuffed this thing in their office, and they kind of went out over the bro net, like, "Hey guys, like we have this here, like come check it out." So I went down and 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 you know played with it enough, and I'm like, "Okay, like here's what I'm gonna do. Every time I see someone that says something bad." I'm going to bring them down here and put them in the sim. And sure enough, we had the amount of people we cycled through that thing in the Pentagon, uh, the people like, I don't, I don't buy into this. And we had you know everything up to like three or four star generals that were like, show, show me this thing. I don't believe it. And it's funny. Like I've probably brought, I don't know, at least 50 people down and put them through that uh, in my friend's office. that's taken up all the space. And, uh, it's funny because I'm like, all right, here's what's gonna happen. Like you're gonna put it on. Like you're gonna have you're gonna say, you know, two two words are gonna come out of your mouth. It's gonna be whoa and whoa. And the first time they <laughs> they like you sit down and um actually three woes. So the first one is like here here's this thing, like put the put the headset on. And then they put the headset on, they start looking around, and they go, Whoa. Cause they're immersed <laughs> in this environment and they're and it's an airborne it's not freeze, it's an airborne aircraft. And they ask them like what what airplane do you wanna fly? Like, oh, I don't know. Like, we'll, we'll pick one. We like we have a menu of like 50 airplanes and you click a button and the whole cockpit changes in, in virtual reality. And like, oh, I want to fly a whatever, P-38. Okay, boop, P-38. And they go, whoa. They go, all right, I'm going to take you off freeze. Like, here's your, uh, you know, here, here are your controls and this and that. And then they go, well, well, what are these controls? Like, oh, forgot to tell you, everything that you're seeing from the computer to the displays to the, the, the stick, the throttle, we bought it all off of Amazon. And they go, whoa. And then they go, ready? Yeah. They go, play. And as soon as the, the, the simulation starts, that's the third woe. They go, whoa, this is crazy. And you see them do like aileron rolls and, you know, they'll fly around the, uh, you know, Bro Brooklyn Bridge and because you can put them anywhere in the world too. And so even though it had, you know, obvious shortcomings, you can see the, the, the effect of being immersed in that kind of environment. Now, obviously, there's a lot of way to, to, to go when you get to, um, hotas and and things like that and when you get to like reconfigurable cockpits you know that's where it's going to be really interesting like you get to like t7 or you can yeah. you know, dial up a, a cockpit configuration and uh eventually um it'll be a um i forget the actual term but you basically push a button and it changes the way the aircraft flies and so you can make it fly like an f-22 or make it fly like an f-16 or make it fly like a you know b1 and so, you know, those types of things are ways to, to automate um, and, and accelerate the, the experiential process that is learning. Um, yeah. So do you see, uh, you, were, you were talking about landing, you know, back in the UPT uh, type days. 
Did you see the the article? Uh, one of the links I put in the merge from last week was about the H sixty pilot. Did you? Did you... No, I didn't. Yeah. So there was no. a there was an H sixty pilot. I think it was a lieutenant actually, and or as a warrant officer, one of those, and he yeah. he had uh, come up with this idea about uh, I wonder if I can just put a camera in my cockpit that will just look at all the gauges. And he basically wrote a, uh, a script that would scrape the data off the gauges and digitize it. And then he built basically like, here's what the optimal like landing profile glide slope looks. So, uh, and then he basically folded that over onto itself. And now he has an automated instructor that debriefs him. When he flies, it can go, hey, your, your approach was too steep or your approach was too shallow. Now you take that, so you have a lifelong now data points of collection of like historically I come in, you know, steep or shallow, and and it can debrief you automatically, and that's just one guy with an idea and a camera was able to do that. There's that's not a funded program. It was just a guy who had an interest in, you know, how how can I do this better, uh, and that's just a guy sitting next to him giving him a debrief. But there's actual data there. Yeah. Collect the data and debrief it. Yeah, it's objective. It's not subjective yep. and feel and based on someone else's experience or vice versa that's interesting i think that's what's going to change but and it's a great analogy you have like at some point you know you got to try to steal second base maybe you die back to first maybe you make it maybe you don't but trying these things so do you think the environment is still there and supportive where these ideas if you come up with it and you flush it out a little bit that the Air Force is willing to try or put energy behind it? Or is it, have we kind of, we've left that phase and now we're down the road of just trying to push people through? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So when you think of like the startup methodology, so imagine that that was a startup company. And so the two things that they're going to want out of that startup is feedback from the customer. So I've delivered a product. How is it going? And so I can iterate. So build, measure, learn, repeat. Um, and the other part is being able to pivot when it doesn't work. And so, uh, as a military, we're generally not good at pivoting. We're really good at yeah. canceling <laughs> or just slugging yeah. it through and go, this is the way, like, it'll be like this forever. So really bad at pivoting and we're not really good. Ironically, we're not really good at feedback. And so one of the, when I worked in the Pentagon, that was kind of the running joke of like, look, it's an air force who like builds war fighters that has a, a credence of there's no rank in a debrief and we debrief everything so we can get smarter and we can all learn. No one debriefs any decisions or anything in the Pentagon. It's on to the next crisis. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> the, the dichotomy of, the, of you know, what you say and what you do at different levels of the bureaucracy is really, really fascinating. And so as we deliver this product to different fleets, whether it's mobility, fighters, they all have things they have not gotten, right? And so the, the issue is providing that honest debrief of like, these are the disconnects. This guy is showing up and does not have airmanship, but he understands you know, how an airplane flies. He understands the instruments. He does not have airmanship. And you know, airmanship's kind of a, a squishy term, as you, as you know, like right. what, is, what does that mean? Yeah. Just like situ a situational awareness. You know, on a scale of one to 10, how much uh, SA do you have? Well, 10. <laughs> until it's zero and you go I actually have no i have no idea what's going on so it's very binary airmanship's a little bit of yeah. the same way uh but being able to provide uh, that feedback number one and number two a place to to track trends so long-term trends not just hey this guy went to the you know the, the basic course and learned to fly an f-16 but you know hey five years later you know how how did we do with this guy like what we cut out you know 50 percent of his his real-time flying as a undergrad you know, five years later, is he is he on his like four ship flight lead? Um, you know, upgrade timeline. Is he on his you know IP? And then individually, if he's not doing well, it doesn't really reflect on the person. It kind of reflects on the process. And so that that's another yeah. part that we are very quickly to you know to say, oh, that guy's not good. Uh, he's he's struggling. Uh, we need we need to cut him. But it, it might not be his fault. So there there's definitely going to be some uh, some victims of the process. Uh, just like you know, ninety percent of startups fail. I think you're gonna we're gonna be putting out some products uh, to the field that that have some disconnects. Uh, and so, you know, again, truth and lending. Do you want that guy in a frontline fighter squadron that's gonna be going somewhere night one right away? Probably not. So there, there's there's other follow on steps I think that have to happen with with immersion. If you you put a guy through an accelerated you know UPT uh, program, 
and then you put them in a traditional fighter squadron that does everything the same way it's done the past 40 years, you know, that's not going to work either. And so having a, a lifelong learning that is adaptive and evolves with that, you know, that kind of model, uh, UPT is, is part of it, but it's not the whole thing. Which I feel like that's not all flushed out because it's impossible. Like we're short on manning, we're short on resources. So when you take someone who's been through one of these unique programs and they're getting pumped right into a normal fighter squadron, the syllabus, the training is at that level is not geared towards it. And I covered a mishap from um, Shaw back in 2020. So, I mean, the apples and oranges here to a certain extent, but Mezzer, you know, he had never been to the tanker. And, you know, that was part of one of these initiatives, I think to, you know, you know, hey, we can waive this or we cut it out of the syllabus in the B course and the CAF squadron can handle it. And I had my buddy who is the chief OGV when, you know, they started seeing these guys flow into Shaw who had never been to the tanker. And they're smart fighter pilots and they're figuring out solutions to do it. And that's just, I think, one kind of glaring, you know, example that is easily recognizable. Like, ah, he has not been to the tanker or has not done sat or whatever it might be that you can easily see. But when you get into the nuances of the training and the airmanship and that squishiness, you might, yeah, like you blame the person for the lack of performance, but maybe based upon their training, their training is different than what someone else went through. You know, how do you manage that? And I say all that because you have experience on Capitol Hill. Again, my perspective is we don't think long term. You know, we're operating two to five years out, best case scenario, or do we have a continuing resolution so we can keep the government open? And then when we talk about doing these programs that really, if we're changing UPT and we need a 10 year look, we need to track that. How do these programs, how are they going to be successful? if we need the ability to track for 10 years or plan for 10 years? They're not. <laughs> a, you know, one, of the, one of the interesting things about that dynamic is that, you know, in the, the way that the phase-based process works is, you know, you complete this phase, congratulations, you know, here's your, here's your certificate, here's your orders, here's the keys to the car, and you go to the next place. Then you go through another phase at the, you know, at the end of that. Congratulations, you know, here's your certificate, handshake, go off to the next one. When people make decisions, you're, you're injecting some uncertainty. And so risk, you know, you look at consequence and um, uh, consequence and frequency of occurrence. So that uncertainty, the person who makes those decisions is accepting no risk. They're passing the risk on to the next phase. And that yeah. is something that's not very well understood about when people make decisions, they're, they may be taking risk, but they're not assuming the risk. They're passing it off to someone else. And so if you're at the end of that pipeline and you're a, 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 a combat air force fighter squadron commander and a guy shows up, you probably have a right to know where has all the risk been taken to the point to get this guy to show up at my doorstep. You know, Oh, we didn't do this. We didn't do that. Okay. Well, and really, then the other part of that is it should be up to the person who's getting that product to go, I do not accept the risk. And that doesn't happen. And so you, the guy shows up, that's your guy, figure it out. You know, it's, right. and that's kind of the military, uh, you don't build your team, which makes us kind of unique as from a leadership philosophy. You know, if you could, you could go out and, and, you know, recruit, rec recruit and build your own fighter squad, you could be the best fighter squad in the world. You find all the right people with right. the right complementing abilities, but we don't. You, you build the team with what you have. And so if that's the, if that's the thing that a squadron commander is going to have, like you build the team with what you have, then you have to give the squadron commander the tools, the resources, the authorities, and because he's accountable. He is accountable for the mission. And so when you give a guy that's accountable for the mission without the resources or authorities to do it, um, that's kind of when the military mission fails. And it, there's, a, there's a long... A uh, prestigious track record of failure that's because of that. And that's not just pilot training. That's in general, everything. Yeah, I, we could talk about that uh, probably forever uh, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in great detail. And that's what I think it's a good per, good perspective, a good point. And I think something to highlight, right? That in that, that calf fighter squadron commander, he's assuming the risk. And this yeah, is just my perspective. But yeah, they can't say no, right? As you said, they don't get to pick their team and it's handed down. And typically they have their, I mean, they had their marching orders, right? And if they want to get promoted, 
they're going to go out there and do their best, but they're juggling a lot of things from meeting everything on their doc statement and making sure that they have the letter of X's and the, and the capabilities and the qualities of the people that need to go out there and do the missions on that doc statement. It's a lot. And there's just, there's a, there's a lot of challenges out there. The one last piece I kind of like to talk about because we've spent a lot of time talking about air force. I want to talk about your career, but I think you have a lot of insight. And again, this is something I encourage people to go out to the merge co you can sign up for the newsletter because paco has a lot of good info and he's very smart and he puts it in gooder words than me so uh <laughs> go over to the, the, the merge.co and check that out but where do you think we're gonna be in a few years air force and again i lean on the fighter squadron because this is where i have the most knowledge but you know my year group in the f-16 was pretty slim i think it was like 15 to 20 guys and then of the of that there are a couple that are now commanders, and those are the couple that stayed in. Most guys got out, transitioned to the Guard or Reserve, or just completely separated. And I go back to that meeting where they said, hey, if you, if you can breathe and fog a mirror, you'll be in 06. But there was not enough of us you know, in 2014 to fill all the upcoming 05 billet, the commander billets. And then, obviously, based on attrition rates, there weren't going to be enough to even fill all the 06 billets down the road. How do you think that's going to impact the Air Force? Is that something that's... Has that problem been solved, or where are we going? Uh, I I definitely uh, you know I'm I live in operational tests these days, so uh, but uh, I do have a lot of friends that are living that in leadership positions in fighter squadrons right now, uh, and I've got other friends that are in mobility, uh, airlift, tanker, et cetera, and you know, the trend is the average age of a, a fighter squadron is getting younger and younger. Now you can correlate age to an extent to experience based on what is the average age when someone starts pilot training. And you can see that while the, they still have a 10 year commitment, the number of people that are staying beyond that um, in the squadrons are going down and your second, uh, you know, the second order uh, uh, problem with that is that when you keep someone in a squadron, so say we ha say you're in your F 16 community, there's a, there's a lot of attrition. And so we have to keep, the guys who want to stay in, we're going to keep them in the squadron flying, which is, you know, that's great. You have, you, you have to do what you have to do, but the air force as an institution uh, will punish that individual. And so they don't, yeah. they don't look like a normal uh, air force officer career progression because the needs of the air force said that they have to stay and fly or they can't go to school or they can't do a staff tour, even if they wanted to. And then a lot of people, uh, you know, you know, poo-poo the staff tours and stuff, but that's where you get perspectives <laughs> and insights and you get to to apply some tools that you've picked up and you and you get to stretch in a different way. And so a lot of people aren't getting those experiences to bring back and to and, and bring those perspectives back. And so, you know, I've seen some fighter squadrons that have, you know, because they like no one in the squadron has ever been to a staff tour, to include the commander. And they, they just do not have a perspective um, that's bigger than, you know, what's going on in the flying schedule. And I think the perspective is really, really important because it allows you to elevate your own narrative and go, what's really going on here? You know, if I, you know, I fly that third go this, this day, like what's the cost benefit? Is it in the big scheme of things, does it matter? No, it just, it makes this one slide turn green at the end of the month. But is it really right. per, like building combat capability? And it, you apply that same kind of critical thinking to like if you're a, if you're in the a basic course a squadron commander and you're getting you know product um, from UPT, we'll just say uh, all hypothetical, and you're saying uh, yeah. <laughs> you know I do not accept this, and you start washing out people because they do not meet the standard, and it's the standard that's been given to you because the squadron commanders don't even own the syllabus. The MAGCOM owns the syllabus. You're in charge of executing, and so if it doesn't meet the standard, you get doesn't meet the standard and when you get to that point and your leadership says no you can't fail them you have to pass them because we need pilots you know at the end of the day is that something worth getting fired over as a commander you know my i have a, a good friend and a former uh, boss of mine you know he's he always called it the air force times uh sanity check you know if this hit the front page of the air force times that i got fired over this am i happy with that and if the answer is like yep <laughs> all right but if it's you get fired over this and it's not something you'd be proud of, like nope. So there is a point of uh, of being a martyr for the greater good, um, but obviously that's 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 a little self sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to see you know, again, just kind of watching it. I think 
the problems there's always problems right there's just been a lot of talk about this and for my generation your generation this has been a big focal point of it and i think we're going to see new problems pop up over the next five to 10 years, right? That rear their ugly head. Hopefully there's smart people that are still in that can solve them. But I do think it is, it's different. We need to leverage technology. We need to embrace some positive change, but again, without sacrificing the quality of the product that we're, we're putting out. And I know there's some trial and error and there's going to be some ships that sink and some that just sail away. It's going to be great, but it'll be interesting to see how all of this plays out because you know, from the ground level, it's usually it's there's not a lot of positive, you know, looks at this and say, hey, we're we're winning this. This is this is what we need to be doing right now. Yeah, when I was uh, when I was flying in a in an operational fighter squadron, uh, that that used to be my my one. I had a, a couple of buddies of mine that were uh, fellow uh, patches, and I say, hey, where where's the good news today? Like, find, I have not found a piece <laughs> of good news today. So it was always my goal to find one piece of good news and. Uh, more times than not, I couldn't find any at the end of the day, yeah. which is which is not good when you're working you know, a twelve or fourteen hour day and you have nothing nothing good came out of it. That you know, it's just you're you're in the grind and you're hoping that you yeah. know it all work out in the end. You're hoping someone else has a bigger picture that's that's you know connecting it all together. And uh, sometimes there is, and uh, sometimes there's not. Yeah, sometimes we're better lucky than good. But <laughs> a good piece of news, right? Which I, I'll find interesting. We kind of transition here. Did you, have you flown the F fifteen EX yet? I have. So I'm uh I don't think we we let off of that. So I'm actually a backseater. So I'm a F fifteen E backseater. And as you know, the F fifteen EX uh is a C model replacement, but it's uh it's got two seats, it's got two missionized cockpits with a few differences uh than the E. But we have uh we have there's only two in the world. Uh they're both here at Eglin Air Force Base where I'm stationed. And uh there's about it's probably 10. I think there's about 10 F-15 EX qualified Wizzos uh, that okay. can go fly. So I actually flew, uh, I flew an E-model at night in the weather uh, doing um, uh, tactical intercepts on Monday night. And then I turned to a F-15 EX um, OCA sweep sortie on Wednesday. And then I flew a developmental test F-15 EX radar uh, run. Um, yesterday against uh, some some okay. pretty good jamming so it's uh yeah so it's it's uh it's an awesome aircraft uh, it does some really cool things um it'll be a really good c model replacement very 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 soon but the uh where the difference between the two is where the c model is absolutely topped out in capability the ex is you know just cracking the door of what it can actually do and so see you know as a surrogate for a c model like yeah it, could, it can do that now um yeah. But that's not the future of that aircraft. What what is the future of the aircraft? Well, it'll it'll uh, it'll be able, it <laughs> it can uh, it will and can carry uh, you know outsized things. So yeah, uh, I think munitions, other kinds of uh, you know whether it's you know uh, drones that it's carrying, so it can you know, something like that. Uh, seven to eight thousand pound weapons, so hypersonics and things like that. Yeah. So those are those are things that you know, an airplane with that big and that was designed that aerodynamically stable, you can do, um, you, to an extent, you know, that's kind of the limitation for fifth gen and a little bit for the F-16 as well. It was designed to be aerodynamically unstable and it's small and it, it's great. It has some great attributes, but there's some things that just physically cannot do. Like I can't put a 10,000 pound weapon on an F-16 wing and hope right. that, you know, it doesn't flip over. Uh, so, you know, size, the size, weight and power uh, that it has as well, because it's so big, it has a lot of room for a lot of avionics and a lot of high powered systems. And so like, whereas, uh, you know, your, your fifth gen guys, uh, are very selective in their, their spectrum management, uh, because they need to hide. And that's not just, you know, in the radar spectrum, but, you know, emissions wise, yeah. No, the F fifteen EX isn't hiding from anything, and so you know if it was Spinal Tap, you could dial it up to eleven, <laughs> and you know you can put out some some pretty good uh, noise and power in the environment. And ultimately, you know, we've flown it, right now. The EX is pretty much synonymous with a, an updated E model, so it's got the same radar and, and all the subsystems are all the same, different cockpit layout. But yeah, you, know, you can take a, a an F fifteen E and pair it with an F thirty five. 
and the F-35 actually becomes more survivable and capable. So individually, the F-35 would, could die in the same scenario, or the F-15E right. e or EX could die. But when you put the complementing attributes of both systems together, it actually creates a win-win scenario. And that's kind of the teaming part of it. And it's it's so interesting that, you know, it, it's the Air Force culture that goes back probably 15 years, back longer than that, about fifth gen technologies, about how that's the only way to go. You know, and a lot of that was based off of scar tissue, scar tissue from the F-22 program, scar tissue from the B-2 program. You know, if we just we just keep saying it, like it'll matter. And I think people are realizing now that you there are scenarios that we absolutely need an an F-35 and F-22 type platform. There's absolutely scenarios that we need something way better than that. And so when you get to the next generation stuff, and we, we have a very good idea of what the scenarios are where we need that. Yep. And then there's scenarios where, you know, we can do something with the F-35 or F-22 or fifth gen in general by complementing it with, with something else. And so you remember when you're in the military and you had the, the hearing test, you could sit in the booth and it's like quiet and you're, you know, pushing the button yeah. and, uh, and it gets quieter and quieter and quieter. And then your, your ears start tuning in to, and you start predicting and you, you're, you're right there. Like, I know it's going to make a noise. If all we had was with things that flew that had the exact same signature you'd basically be in that hearing booth looking for that very very everyone's keyed in on trying to cue into that faint sound now if you put that faint sound in a rock concert zero percent chance you're going to see it or hear it yeah and so that's kind of the the different signature aspects and how they're complementing uh yeah you flew the viper so you know what's better than uh than a ge 129 engine What's two, of them. two of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so we were, uh, you know, we were flying last week, and uh, yeah, pretty, pretty right after takeoff, you know, getting our scenario, and we're in a, we're in a F fifteen EX with CFTs, uh, targeting pod, laner pod, because of the uh, Seek Eagle weight and balance right now, and we have our normal like uh, Cadams and our uh, you know, P five pod, and yeah. you know, we're in the forty super cruising. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like, yeah. So it, it's it's a thing. It's uh, it's got it's got power. It's got it's got payload, and it's got some range. And so that's that's uh, those are good attributes to have to complement the force. Yeah, it's awesome. I you know a little bit of the fighter integration before I did demo, and you know the F thirty five gets a lot of flack, you know, to this day, and it probably will forever. And then doing air shows, you're always talking to people, and they're always asking about the F thirty five and dogging it. And my one like limited experience was doing a WESEP down there and we would do LFEs in the afternoon, large force exercise for those listening who don't know, but where we might take normally four Vipers to guard a 40 nautical mile wild lane, we would do one F-35 and two of us. Obviously we were much more lethal basically because we're all playing together and we're all talking their strengths and weaknesses that we each have. We were missile trucks, you know, clean the rails and, and go home. Whereas the F-35 couldn't do that. Right. But, we could share and do different things. And that's like a very rudimentary explanation of it. But again, it's all about playing as a team and playing off each other's strengths and weaknesses. I love the analogy of the rock concert because I mean, that's, that's spot on. What, what is the plan currently for the EX? Like as far as procurement and how it's going to integrate into the overall plan. If we're talking about, you know, near peer adversaries, which, I think that's the new hotness. Yeah, so that's a that's a really great question. So I'm not the spokesman for the Air Force, so I can't tell you officially uh, what it is. Um, I I have my own opinions. Uh, it was it was uh, an OSD assessment that the Air Force needed a fourth gen a freshened up fourth generation fleet. So OSD made that decision. Um, what you can agree with it or not, but at the end of the day. Um, there is a rapid fielding requirements document that says that the EX is a C-model replacement unit. It has non-interference air-to-ground uh, weapons integration testing that we're doing with it uh, here. We haven't done any of that yet. Um, we're focused on doing the software regression and uh, pilot vehicle interface, PVI, for the new screens. And so um, it's, it, it's, it's pretty far along as far as a C-model replacement. There's only two in the world, so it doesn't really do any good. <laughs> and the two and i don't think most people realize that yeah we we, we got these aircraft but we they're not real 100 percent true f-15 ex's they are uh they cut the production line from the qatari buy and they took two jets from the qatari production line 
and then put all of the US stuff in it. And so when you look at okay. EX1 and EX2, um, some of the, uh, there's bumps and things around the airplane that are for EW systems that, that are for the foreign EW system. So we have actually a domestic EW system, EVHAS, and then we have the foreign um, uh, bumps on, on the airplane, if you will, for uh, the, whatever the Qatari version is, the dues, I think it is. But, but it's not installed. Gotcha. So it looks weird. It's wired a little different and it's, it's wired for tests. So it's, you know, it's an orange wired jet. Uh, when we get the, the next ones, and so we'll, ha we'll have the next six are also orange wired and they have some um, fiber backbone, open missions architecture that's, that's capable. Uh, we haven't built a plan for that yet. So that's, uh, we're waiting on someone to figure that out. Uh, but when you, when you look at what are you going to do with the airplanes when they start showing up, I think you, you, there's a problem uh, and the problem is like in the narrative. And so, you know, the, everyone wants the new hotness. Everyone wants this, this jet. And that's great. If you want it to be a C model replacement, go send it to the C model FTU, have them build a conversion syllabus because it flies differently. Um, and if you're a C model guy and we we're out uh, the other day, if you, if you're a C model guy and an E model guy and you're flying, you know, the two EXs against each other in BFM, uh, there are some handling attributes and flight control inputs that uh, are way different and will put you in a square corner very quickly. And so, you know, you, you have to build a conversion for that. And then ultimately it was a rapid replacement. So we want to get that capability in the field. And I, here's where the sticking point is, is that, yeah, I could, you can get the, the EX to the field. If there were more to buy right now, if there were more, we're buying them, but there are more being delivered. Yeah. You know, they have to build them obviously. And so it takes a couple of years, but we can get that to the fleet, but ultimately you just get a, a C model equivalent. If you keep them in test and we're able to develop these other things and other capabilities, um, th so that's kind of the dichotomy. Do we do we speed up and and accelerate them to the fleet to recap the C model? Uh, and you know it's not a one for one replacement. So we know like F thirty five squadrons are going to be stood up to replace F fifteen C Sundown. Uh, so it's not a one to one replacement. And so when you look at the EX and, and future growth, you know, there's a reason why there's a, se there's a second cockpit uh, that was, it, there's a future growth uh, potential. And I think everyone sees it's kind of like UPT. I don't really know what yeah. right looks like, but there's definitely something here, whether it's man-on-man -man teaming, uh, being like a quarterback or, um, you know, battlefield EW coordinator. So if you're complementing EW packages from across entire strike packages, not just individual pilots pushing a button. So there, there's some really right. interesting things that you can start getting into when you when you get to that that second cockpit, but that kind of uh, transcends the the normal um, F-15C historic mission. Uh, and then when you look at where they're going to be, so whether it's active, guard, reserve, homeland defense, if it's going to be um, have a protection, and so there's 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 tons of missions that do not require uh, the signature of a fifth gen platform. But all the missions that we do today require the fifth gen sensors of, a, of the platform. And so when you look at all the new stuff we're buying, you think it's a fourth gen aircraft. Like, no, it's a it's a fifth gen uh, everything wrapped in a fourth gen, you know, body. And so I don't need yeah, that makes yeah sense. I don't need stealth to intercept the Russian bomber uh, at, off the coast of Alaska. <laughs> like it's a bomber. Uh, number one, yeah. I can see him for hundreds of miles away. Like it's not surprising. <laughs> but, you know, people don't normally think about you know the threat that way it's not necessarily a it's a threat to your target or what to you're defending but maybe not a threat to you and right. and that narrative gets very uh muddied very quickly you just need to be able to see it i think the f-35 then bringing that online there's obviously there's a lot to talk about there but it seems like the methodology of bringing in people from different platforms worked out obviously there's some things that could be be done better but bring in raptor a10 f16 f15 e f15 c guys and gals there to all coming from different communities different mission sets to then figure out how to best employ this new plane and not just oh it's a we're just doing air to air and you know it's like there's a whole mission set that go there's multiple mission sets that go along with it and people from different backgrounds and expertise that can help figure out how to best utilize it to do mission x y or z so maybe that, I mean, hopefully that will happen with the EX based upon what it's capable of versus just a one-for-one -one replacement. That's a, that's a really great point. So what I didn't highlight is that the, you know, I said there's F-15 EX WIZOs that are qualified. And so we're doing air-to-air -air with them, but we're also doing some other things. Um, I think air-to-ground, multi-roll type stuff. 
because that's it's part of the the test on a non-interference basis. But when you look at the front seat, the, most of the people uh, that are flying the EX, uh, if you're if they were C model pilots, uh, with the exception I think one person, every C model pilot we sent them through an F-15E transition course to get them dual qualified. They let they flew the E for a while and then. We did a local conversion training for EX because E and EX, the the HOTAS, the displays, everything is the same. It's just the difference if it's through a you know 1970s monochrome display or a large touchscreen. And it has a few nuances, but uh, going okay. into that and and all of the the E, the C, and the EX all have a common um, software. And so uh, as the F15C sundowns, we were trying to merge all the software into one development uh, to cut down on costs. But then at, there's some compromises. That go along with that that we've ran into with what should the HUD look like? Or I want my host has to do this. And so the C yeah. the C model guy, I want it to do this. And the E model guy's like, well, you can't because there's 10 other functions that does in these missions because it has a oh, well, I didn't realize that. And so it's really good to have this eclectic group of experience. Um, again, it's like all ranks from captain to lieutenant colonels, from uh, guard, active, reserve, C model, E model. And so it's a, it's a really good team. Uh, we've actually uh, here we've merged our division. We used to have a, a strike division and a C model division. Now we just have a twin tail division. Everyone works in the same thing all together. And so it's it's yeah. been really it's been really fun that, to learn some of the uh, the things from the. Um, there's a lot of isms, you know, you pick up from the other communities, as you know. But it's really right. it's been awesome just throwing it all together, and uh, you know, it's been awesome. Uh, I've I've really yeah, appreciated cool, being yeah. part of the team. Yeah, that's exciting to be yeah, you know, kind of the cutting edge, something something new as it always is. But uh, with that being said, I do want to transition a little bit. I want to talk. I mean, we're we're gonna jump back a little bit. You have an interesting path into the jet. You started out as a Marine. What yeah, what was the uh, what'd you do in the Marine Corps? How did you get there? And then what was the transition? Why'd you jump into the Air Force? Ooh, all right, let's go uh, jump in the way back machine. So I uh in my senior year of high school, I uh, I worked a lot, worked a couple jobs at the same time, and school was pretty easy for me. I didn't study a whole lot, but I got you know A's and B's, and I just kind of felt uh, I wasn't challenged. So I didn't really, uh, my parents really didn't push me too hard on college. I didn't really understand the process uh, that I do now now that I have kids. I didn't understand like it was actually a big thing, a significant emotional event to prepare to you know apply to colleges yeah. and take all this testing. I had no idea. And so all my friends around me are, you know, doing SATs and filling out college applications. I'm like, huh, am I supposed to be doing that? I think I am. Like, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I had a friend that was, uh, you know, interested in the military, and he, and a couple of guys who were kind of interested in the military, and they and ended up uh, joining as a uh, the delayed entry program. And he's like, oh, you should do this. It's awesome. I'm like, eh, I don't know. So long story short, uh, recruiter talked me into it. It's like I want to, you know, I looked at kind of all the services very, very quickly. And it was very clear, like, I want to do, what? what is the hardest one? Like, well, that one, that one's going to suck the most. I'm like, all right, I want to do that. Uh, <laughs> because I wanted to try something to kind of push myself. And so I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1997. Um, I was stationed in, uh, first assignment was in New River, which is over by Camp Lejeune. Uh, I was a helicopter mechanic. So I worked on uh, Hueys, Cobras, 46s, and 53s. And then... Uh, I was getting ready to spin up for a deployment with the MU, and so I got qualified as a, an aerial observer, so a door gunner on the on the 46. Okay. And we were supposed to deploy uh, September 19th, 2001. And so you look at the timing. Uh, so we deployed. <laughs> it was a planned deployment, yeah. uh, not to where we had planned on going. And so yeah. I ended up in Afghanistan um, in the very beginning of enduring freedom when it was, uh, infinite justice, that's what it was called in the beginning before they renamed yeah. it. So uh, yeah, I was in Afghanistan in, uh, in 2001 and 2002 as a, uh, as a Marine on the ground, basically doing troop insertions from the South. And that was operation swift freedom. And so there's uh, there's, you can go back in the history and look at that. So general Mattis was a, uh, was this brand new one star at the time that we worked for. So it was, uh, it's interesting to see. I saw him, you know, in the, when he's a secretary of defense, I, I got a solemn, we had a meeting with him one day and I mentioned, and he's like, oh yeah. So we sat and talked for a few minutes about it. <laughs> pretty, yeah, pretty right. Good. So that was a, uh, were you guys, yeah, go ahead. Were you at a bastion? Was it, yeah. Uh, well, no, it was before that. So we were up in, uh, yeah. 
in Pakistan, uh, and then we went up to um, Rhino, so Fob Rhino. Uh, it was kind of out okay. in the middle of nowhere. And then we were actually in Kandahar. So I've got pictures of me in 2001, like in front of the Kandahar air, airfield. Uh, yeah. You know, signed with like probably green Humvees and stuff. You know, all we had back then, just, you know, put it in there. And so uh, so flew missions out of there, uh, flying the 46, doing uh, assault raids and, and picking up bad guys and stuff like that. So I did that. And I figured that was actually the end of my tour. So we were uh, married, had a, had a kid when I went on deployment. Actually re-enlisted going through the Suez Canal on the way to Afghanistan in 2001. <laughs> and I re-enlisted with a, <laughs> with a uh, assignment guarantee to go to Hawaii. So oh, that sounds great. We'll go there. Yeah. Let me get my, let me get my school things in order. Cause now I know that like, I don't want to be, I don't want to play GI Joe forever. Uh, I need to figure something out. So uh, I came back from Afghanistan moved to Hawaii. Uh, I doubled up on school. I probably set a world record for uh, having the gained a college degree in the fastest amount of time possible uh in that time i uh, i said well you know by the time i get done i'll have about eight years in and you know if i get to 20 i get a little pension like this air force thing looks like it's uh the opposite of what i'm doing now like i i'm kind of getting tired of what i'm doing like that's opposite i get more money it's like supposed to be like you know the chair force it'll be great yeah uh and so i go talk to a recruiter i'm like yeah i want to be a pilot is that is that a thing and at the time I'm like well like if you, if you have a pilot license and all this you have like a seven percent chance because we just had way too many I'm like, oh, well, that sucks. I go, well, you can be this navigator if you want. Like, it has like a 98% selection rate. And I was like, oh, that sounds yeah. dumb. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it's, it's like a staff sergeant recruiter. And he's like, well, there's a there's a sub-career field called the weapon systems officer. I go, oh, what's that? He goes, oh, they only have it on the B1 and the F-15E. Uh, but I can't give that to you. You have to you have to apply for it and, like, compete for it. I go, okay, I I'll do that. I I'll win. I know. And so I, uh, <laughs> I applied and it's, I had to long story, I'd applied to get an exemption from the Marine Corps to go apply to the air force on condition of acceptance. So I had to pick something that I was going to pretty sure I got picked up. Then I got deployed to Iraq, uh, <laughs> while, while this process was going on. So, uh, I deployed and I got, uh, I got recalled, uh, on 53s as an, uh, as a war gunner. And so I ended up, uh, going to Japan, getting on a, a, a 31st Mew, sailing over to uh, the Middle East, offloading into Kuwait, pushing up to Iraq. And we were based out of Al-Assad during Operation Phantom yeah. Fury, so the Battle of Fallujah. So I'm, yeah. we're flying uh, you know, troop lifts and uh, assault raids all over the city and all over you know, northwestern Iraq. And I get an email saying, hey, you're, you, congratulations, you've been selected to go to the Air Force. I'm like, oh, awesome. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take care of this when I get home in a few months. Like, no, no, you don't understand. Like you have 30 days to report to MEPS for your, your physical. Otherwise, like you lose your spot. I'm like, Oh crap. So, uh, so that's, uh, I probably write a book about that, but long story short, I ended up, uh, <laughs> uh, E and E my way across the world home, uh, from Iraq to Kuwait. I caught a flight from Kuwait to, um, the, uh, um, Heathrow and then Heathrow to Atlanta, Atlanta to, LA, LA to Honolulu back home. And, uh, and by the time I was gone for uh, probably five or six months, my entire chain of command had retired. And so oh. now everyone's like, who, who are you? What are you doing here? I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back from deployment to, uh, to check out and go in the air force. Like, no, you're not like, so <laughs> it, it was, uh, it was, it was not easy, but I finally like, kind of like, I'm not making this up. Here's the paperwork. Like, well, you, you forged the paperwork. No, no, no. So, uh, so long story short, I ended up getting out and, uh, I ended up checking into the air force, uh, officer training school one day late because you can't, I could not get on the bus to go to the air force, um, uh, processing because I had one day left in the Marine Corps. So I had to wait till midnight to be processed out of the Marine Corps to then the next day be processed into the air force. So I showed up to OTS one day late. And of course, it's like, oh, who's this guy? You think you're special? Like, oh, Jesus, you have no idea what I just went through to get here. <laughs> and, it, and the funny part about OTS was that it's uh, they have a list of like who are the prior enlisted. But again, uh, it's funny how systems work. The, they, they only look at prior Air Force. And so yeah. I, had, I went the first probably two or three weeks in OTS just not telling anyone. And I was like this, yeah, like I've been through Marine Corps boot camp, like Air Force officer school is going to be fun. And, uh, yeah, so <laughs> it was, it was a good time. And, uh, so in that they're like, Hey, uh, you know, I was so dumb. I didn't know anything. Uh, 
I'm, I'm a little bit better, but I'm still dumb and don't know anything. But at the time, you know, I'm in, I'm in, you know, eight years now in the military. I'm in the Air Force uh, officer training school to be a navigator, and I'm I go to the you know the DFAC or the you know, the lunch hall. They have all these posters and stuff of all these aircraft, you know, fighters, bombers, and all. I couldn't tell you the difference between an F-15, an F-18, an F-16. I couldn't tell you the difference. I have no idea. I'm like, I'm just happy to be here. I'll figure it out. Right. And uh, yeah, so. I applied to this thing, got picked up. I went through um, uh, nav training in Pensacola, which was joint at the times, which was awesome. Yeah, so it was like terrible, half Navy, half terrible. Air Force and the Submarines. Yeah. And then I uh, ended up going uh, tracking the Strike Eagle. And then, uh, and so here I am, you know, a couple of ops assignments, weapon school, taught the FTU, a couple thousand hours. And then, uh, yeah, so I flew, flew that for a while. And then I do have, uh, <laughs> I think you pointed it out, I do have one sortie in an F-18 counts <laughs> it counts what was that it counts so it, uh, again cra- crazy stories so i ended up uh flying uh in a, F- a fa-18f off the uss ronald reagan on a combat mission as one bravo uh as a lieutenant <laughs> how, how, how did that happen other than the fact that i know like probably blanket statements the navy and just anything goes <laughs> yeah we were uh our L and O's and we were all deployed from my, uh, one of my first deployments as, as in the air force it was my third deployment to date, third combat deployment, first air force deployment. And, uh, the L and O's that are squadrons and in the boat sat next, sat next to each other at the chaos and like, Hey, wouldn't it be great if we like swap backseaters? Like, yeah, let's do that. So they worked it all out. And so we sent two lieutenants from Bagram, you know, all the way down awesome. to by rain to, to then, Get, yeah. catch a, a cod flight to the reagan and then they were going to send two navy wizzos kind of reverse path up to vagram and apparently what had happened is while we were in route the the navy changed their mind and decided not to send their guys to, to us because they said well if the ship leaves we can't get them back and like that we don't accept that risk but the air force is like well if the ship leaves and we can't get our guys back we do accept that risk they're just lieutenants we don't care yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> actually better <laughs> yeah so i ended up uh, going down uh, there's the two of us went down there me and a buddy of mine and uh they had they had three sorties and there was two of us and i like, pick, pick which ones you want and so uh, my bu- my buddy got to do a uh, a day and a night kind of local uh, training sorties uh and then i got to do the uh like 6.5 or 7.0 beach sortie up to uh, to oef and uh, I got awesome. so close. I had troops in contact. I had nine line and everything. I think oh, this would be fantastic. I get the guide in a laser yeah. guided bomb, uh, f- flying an F eighteen oh. as a lieutenant in the Air Force. <laughs> that would be, that'd been awesome. <laughs> That's cool. It's surprising that you know, they like even let that happen. You know, nowadays I feel like nah. The easy answer is always no. That's know? right. So it's cool when so, when something like that actually like hey, you know what. Common sense wise, like, yeah, we could probably do this to be a good experience. And, you know, you know, I've been fortunate, some, some more tools you know, I told you all that stuff and there's a ton more, but I've been really fortunate to, to have a lot of people, you know, do just that with me. Like, yeah, why, like, I'll take a chance. I'll take a chance on this. You know, again, what's the worst thing that could happen? Right. And so I, I try to adopt that same mentality. I've been very, very fortunate over my, uh, my 24 years and counting of service so far yeah. and the opportunities I've had, uh, you know, it's. I've been been to a lot of places and I have a lot of different um, experiences. I've been stretched in a lot of different ways. And when people are interested in doing the same thing, I see a little bit of myself in them and I absolutely yeah. want them to, to experience what I've been through. And, and I don't want to be that roadblock for them. Yeah, it's awesome. I and mean, that's what the Air Force needs is guys like that to be willing to take some chances, right? Because you're buying risk. Usually, obviously, you're, you're way in it, but you're, ultimately, it's going to come with buying some kind of risk when you're stepping outside of the norm. Uh, to do that but i think it's important because otherwise it just stagnates and then again you're not putting tools in someone's tool bag right if, it, if you're not expanding the horizons and doing different things so i know that that sounds like a really cool experience i always wanted to i i always want to fly the hornet probably just once uh i never want to land on the boat there's no point in my mind to land on the boat because you're just stuck there that was a, you want a cat shot yeah a cat shot would be cool so i did the uh i did the cat shot and the trap on the on the the cod and on the uh the F model on the Super Hornet, and the, in the for people who don't know the 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 COD the the Greyhound, you sit backwards, so you get launched and recover facing backwards, and then to do it in the Super Hornet, you're obviously facing forward, and uh, 
those were significant emotional events. Uh, I was not <laughs> prepared for how violent. Uh, I mean, you see the videos, you go, oh, that looks violent. Yeah. To actually like experience it, like that was a different level of, of violence. So much violence. <laughs> so much. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you can speak to this because you did a DARPA fellowship. The Fighter Pilot podcast, uh, Jello had uh, 06 on there. I forget his name. This is a few months back. I was listening to it. And he, the DARPA uh, colonel, he asked, he's like, how many, you know, traps do you have? And Jello knew to the T the number of traps he had. It was like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a thing of pride. Yeah, yeah. Guys. They have centurion it, patches when they hit 100, yeah. Yeah, which, you know, I, I mean, I, get, I had uh, a buddy on here who did a Hornet exchange, and he got 100 traps, you know, so he could say well over 100. He did 101 traps, so he could say well over 100 traps. You know how I know that there's a Centurion uh, patch, by the way? <laughs> The uh, the the Navy fighter squadron on the boat that that hosted us for like five or six days, they were awesome. And at the end of it, uh, I got a Centurion patch that was like that. Uh, the two extra zeros were like stitched over, and so it had a one with a big blob next to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome! Uh, great, oh. great guys. Oh, hey. great guy and girls. There's guys and girls. Great, great people. What I, I actually in New Orleans, I took a cable for a brake failure and, you know, a bunch of Navy guys were there and I took the departure end cable. Like, by the time I realized I had a brake failure, put the hook down, take the departure end cable and caught so much flack, you know, because you're like, oh, you didn't take the approach end cable. Like, no, that's putting a, a hook down in a, in a you know, Air Force aircraft is a significant emotional event. I'm not excited about this. Yeah, I've, uh, I've taken I've taken a cable a few times. I uh I made I made uh I made headline news for taking a cable once back in uh, uh we could talk we could talk war stories all day long if you want to hear that story yeah where, yeah, where, yeah, where is that so at? we were in uh we were in Iraq in 2014 uh, in northern Iraq uh, doing good work and at the time um, everything that was going on in Iraq was attributed to the Navy where like 90 percent of everything actually going on was air force but because of basing yeah. sensitivities we just say it's the navy but most things when you read in the press it says the navy it may or may not be the navy so we were up in uh, northern iraq and uh our uh, our wingman's like hey can you check check fuel it looks like you have a fuel leak like, that's weird so we go look at our uh, our fuel state I'm like huh no everything looks fine we got no cautions no nothing and uh like it clear to rejoin so give us a battle damage check like yeah you're definitely streaming you're definitely streaming a lot of stuff out of your, uh, out of the right side of your jet. I'm like, well, that's weird. We don't see any. And about at that point, all of our indications started going off. We had a hydraulic <laughs> leak and it was like the worst type of hydraulic leak that we have in our aircraft, which is like total pending hydraulic failure. Uh, so it's the, the, the system that's the backup system basically yeah. blew a, uh, blew a valve. And so it was like the backup reservoir. So all of the stuff, all the primary stuff is going into the backup system, which is just emptying out. And uh, you can see our hydraulic pressure is like slowly falling. I'm like, okay, well, we only have so much time. So uh, we were supposed to, uh, Kuwait was our go-to place to divert. Uh, and we know that uh, because we just flew over it like 45 minutes to an hour before, there was a massive sandstorm that had rolled in. So all the ops out of Kuwait were canceled, runways closed. Like, there's no way you're going to fly through a sandstorm to land there. Yeah. And so we're looking at like, well, Baghdad's right there. And like, well, based on what we know is going on right now like that i don't want to go there either there's no u.s presence yet nothing <laughs> and so uh we're like well we're in northern iraq i guess we're going to go into turkey and so we uh we we got on guard and uh we end up going to turkey we didn't even have i don't we didn't even have an approach plate we had nothing because it wasn't even a divert it wasn't a no plan but it was the nearest place to land so we uh, we crossed the turkey everyone's yelling at us in a different language uh, on guard and we're trying to like we're you know emergency this and that and we end up going to batman and you know we don't have hydraulics we have no brakes so we have to take a cable and we're in a fully loaded uh strike eagle and so i think we had uh you know three probably three jdams four laser guided bombs four stvs live missiles and you know all the weight for our fuel and right. we don't want to dump the gas because we're in no man's land so like i guess we'll just land a little heavy plus all the weight from the weapons yeah so we, uh, we actually used a targeting pod to figure out which side of the runway the cable was strung and then and then set up a uh, approach to, to take the cable. Uh, long story short, we took the cable, ripped the cable out of the ground, broke the cable in half. It snapped back, hit the aircraft, hit the right engine, and we had to pull our emergency brakes, which then popped the tires. And long story short, it's a really great picture. We're about halfway down this runway, and it's just 
metal, like just two metal streaks that are like thousands of feet long from uh-huh. the brake stack, just digging into the runway. And, uh, so we shut, we were, we were sitting there like, Oh my God, we made it. We, we survived. It's a dual use, uh, runway. So there's actually like a commercial terminal there and there's a military. So the Turkish military comes out and they uh, surround our aircraft and we're like, uh, you know, we have SATCOM. So we're trying to talk to our ops desk, which is like 1200 miles away. Oh, yeah. And the way that our jet came to rest, the antenna wasn't pointing very well. So we were getting like just a few clips. Like, I don't know anyone in Turkey. I don't have a divert checklist. I don't have a phone number to call. I don't have anything. And so we, yeah. uh, it was a very interesting uh, journey to get back, uh, get the aircraft out of there. But that's uh, when it when it shut the runway down. It made the local news because you could see an F-15 on the runway with a bunch of weapons, right? And uh, and then that got picked up in the Middle East. So you look, there's F-15s in uh, in in Iraq. Well, yep, that was that was us. <laughs> Those are, the uh, I, we're probably there about the same time. I got there in October of fourteen and left in spring of fifteen. Yeah, I was uh, uh, I, I was there for. Uh, yeah, night one in Syria, September twenty third. I know that because I was the strike package commander. Uh, yeah, and uh, and yeah, so we were doing that, and we probably left in October. So um, yeah, you guys ripped out the uh, the uh, other squadron in Jordan, right? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we ripped out the Sawa guys, um, and then I want to say maybe the fourth is who probably ripped you guys out. Um, like yeah, yep, that's right. Yep, yeah. Uh, so. That's yeah. I we actually had uh, one which had tally shoes on here, and is our squadron weapons officer. This is later on the plane, but you know it's still like diverting into Turkey was a significant emotional event for the majority. I mean, I would say all of our deployment, and there was lots of back and forth as far as what the ROEs were. If you're going to jettison everything, if you got across the border, and vice versa. But they actually had. It was towards the end. We actually had several jets that had fuel issues, and there were different ones. And on this particular sortie. Uh, poker is a weapons officer. He has uh, a fault indication, and then his gauges go to zero. And then as Tally's checking her jet, she also had. I mean, it's just like perfect storm. Both of them have fuel issues, so they divert into to Saudi into this one field um, that we only had a, like a Jeppesen approach plate for, and it was a CTAF controlled. Like click, you know, seven times to light up the runway. They divert into there. You know, kind of similar story talking on satcom trying to figure out but it's amazing to see how fast things can happen while the jets are still running you know they see a you know bongo truck coming you know across the desert it's like this is gonna go one of two ways and uh they one of them shut poker shuts down and it's an apache pilot and a saudi apache pilot is like hey i'm johnny cash you know and like his (laughs) accent and that i mean they got the jets turned and out of there pretty quick and obviously it was a remote part of saudi so there wasn't a lot of news and press for it but there's motivation that runs all the way up the chain and, you know, over to the state department and back down. So it's kind of crazy to see that stuff. And obviously stuff like that's still going on today. You know, you just don't hear about it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. We, we got in our situation, it was really interesting because when we crossed the border into Turkey, we actually left the CENTCOM. So we flew in the Yukon. Yeah. And so it made this huge, like three and four star generals are arguing about things because now we're in a different MAGCOM and who owns us? I'm like, Oh, are you kidding me? Or a different COCOM. Yeah. Oh. terrible see there's bureaucracy know, everywhere <laughs> yeah no matter where you are right like what's the, what do we do what's the mission here like let's just let's line up and get the mission done. exactly yeah. yeah that's crazy <laughs> well paco before we uh, kind of transition out again i want to mention the merge newsletter and go over to the merge.co sign up for that if you're interested in defense type news coming from fighter pilots you know it's kind of no bs it's no bs it's objective i really enjoy it i appreciate you putting the time in to do that i know you know, it's not it's not an easy thing a lot of time. So if you're interested in kind of really getting what's going on, not the fluff pieces, the merge newsletter and again the merge.co. Is there anything else you kinda of like to highlight about that? Because I'll have one more question for you, but I'll give you a chance to talk about the merge if you want. Yeah, I'd I'd say uh, you know, every day you have a you have a choice to make. You can either be smarter or dumber. And you know, <laughs> if you do nothing, you will get dumber because, you know, time passes by. So make the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> Simple to the point. The last question I got for you is I always ask my guests, you know, if you found 16, 17 year old Paco walking on the street, is there any advice you'd give him tips, tricks, or tell him to do something different? Hmm. Don't suck and just go try it. So I think yeah. we have a lot of, a lot, I see a lot of people who, who don't take shots uh, because they're worried about they might fail. And so I've, uh, I never had that problem. And, uh, 
I wish I would have uh, embraced that a little bit earlier in my career. So I try to do what matters um, most and then let the chips fall where they fall. Awesome. Well, Paga, I appreciate you joining me on the podcast. It'd be fun to have you back on here, talk about some more stuff, because, again, you have a lot of great insight. So thanks for taking the time. Anytime. Thanks. Appreciate it.